Hello, this is John Thankara. And the more we learn about life on Earth, the clearer it becomes that the well-being of humans and of non-humans is interconnected. They are a single story. Sustainable design in this context means designing for all of life, not just human life. That's a big step. Not so long ago, it was considered progressive in the design world to design for humans. That was a step forward. And now we have to design for all of life. And not just large visible life forms like trees or bears. All of life, it turns out, includes microbes. They are all around us, inside us, but invisibly. In fact, 99% of life is invisible. And how do we design for that? To find out from somebody who knows about this very deeply, uh, I welcome my guest today, um, the scientist Dr. Sue Ishak, whose talk I saw a couple of weeks ago, which just made me realize how little I know and how much we can learn from her and her community. There's a whole lot of information in the text below this uh, uh, film, uh, but please, Sue, welcome. And tell us what do you do as a scientist studying microbiomes and all of that. Yeah, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share my science journey um, and kind of talk about how I've gotten here and what I do. So I'm currently an assistant professor at of animal and veterinary sciences at the University of Maine. I've been here for two and a half years and my lab focuses on the microbes that are found in and on animals what they might be doing for the animals, to the animals, and how that animal's environment might be impacting the types of microbes that they pick up and interact with. And then another facet of what I do is to work in the sphere of microbes and social equity. And is this a new field? Um, have you, are you kind of creating this subject area or are there are large numbers of people doing it that people like me have been ignorant about? Yeah, I feel like there is a really large field and we're, we've actually all been ignorant of each other because we tend to use very field specific jargon. We tend to work with other researchers who or other designers who are already in our field and we don't necessarily um, get that communication or that information sharing that's really, really broad spectrum that can help us understand these broad concepts. So. Um, when I was first starting this work, back when I was at the University of Oregon in 2018, 2019, um, I thought that I was creating something sort of new. Um, and I realized that I was just maybe creating a new hashtag. The more I read research and the more I looked into it, the more I realized that people have been uh, doing quite a lot of work concerning microbes and how they might impact social systems and vice versa. Um, this work has been ongoing all over the world for a number of decades. We maybe just didn't call it that. Um, and so it's really been this ongoing conversation that I have that I always learn um, new terms or new ways to think about this. And um, I meet new people who are already working in this sphere. We all have our buzzwords to carry around. So that's why I'm so happy to meet somebody from a different world. And I think we're going to look at some of the slides that you shared in your talk a couple of weeks ago to to have a visual kind of reference point. So I'm gonna share the screen if you hold with me. So basically my starting point, which I, I frankly didn't know, is that 99% of life is invisible because it's microbial. Just take us through that. What am I looking at here? That it's in, not just in little uh, areas, it's everywhere. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. So these are two uh, cartoon schematics that I really like, um, partially because they are so visually engaging. And I think it really helps bring this message across that microbes are everywhere. Um, because if you're not in microbiology and you're not in human health, you maybe don't learn about microbes most of the time, or maybe you only hear about them in reference to fermentation or food systems. But microbes are in fact um, nearly everywhere. Um, so they are found in soil, air, water. Um, they're not always found in large numbers, so you don't find nearly as many in air as you would find in soil. Um, but they'll be in plant tissues and on leaf surfaces. They will be on the skin of animals and humans. Um, they're not in all of our body tissues, but they do tend to be in those areas that have an interaction with the outside world. So they'll be in our mouth and our nose and our lungs. 
um, they make up quite a bit of the uh, mass that's in our digestive tract. Um, you can also find helpful communities in the vagina. And so in all of these locations, the microbes are really responding to their environment in the same way that a deer out in the forest would respond to its environment. So the uh, chemical composition, um, the temperature, the light, um, and whether or not it, that microbe is interacting with the host, all of these things start to create an environment that that uh, microbe either likes to live in or doesn't. So if you're thinking about the digestive tract as an ecosystem, the foods that you put into your digestive tract act as the basis of that ecosystem to attract different microbes that like to eat those foods. So if I look at this kind of visualization, they're all changing all the time. It's not a static thing. So for in the design world, one has certain parameters that you try and understand. OK, we'll put that there and that there. But you're describing constant flux. Yes and no. So you will get the same microbial players showing up over and over again, especially if you like to eat the same foods over and over again, you'll attract those there. There are also certain microbes that are just really good at living in particular environment. So they really like living in the mouth versus they really like living on the bottom of your feet. And so you will get these, these constant fluxes. So every time you touch a surface or you touch a cup, any of the microbes that might have been on your skin or on that surface have the potential to transfer back and forth, but it doesn't mean that they like to live where you've just put them. And so they might not persist there forever. And so I tend to think about it as like a crowd of a city. So you have a lot of that population that lives in that city all the time, but then you also have tourists or short-term visitors that will pop in and out. Um, so you do get this flux and every time you have a new person coming into that city, they bring their experiences and their capabilities with them. And when they leave that community, they often bring that their experiences with them to their next location. Um, and so you can kind of think of microbial communities in the same way. Which is a great uh, moment to move on to this next picture because this, I remember, you saying that most of us, if we know much about cows, they're large single things. But tell me, there's more than one kind of ecosystem of microbes happening inside a cow, if I understand correctly. Absolutely. So the digestive tract of any mammals, but especially of cows, is really complicated. And each piece of it has very specific purposes that it's responsible for. And because of that, it creates different anatomy, different physiology. And you can kind of think of this as different landscapes or different architecture related to single function. For example, a, a bathroom is designed very differently than a kitchen because you've got different purposes, right? And so because you've got these different little mini ecosystems happening across the length of a digestive tract, you end up attracting different microbial communities that prefer to live there. So if you've got very um, acidotic conditions, you'll get microbes that like that. If you've got um, particular foods breaking down and becoming chemically available in certain locations in the digestive tract, microbes that like to eat those food components will be found there. And so this particular image is looking at the microbial, specifically the bacterial communities that we found in different organs along the digestive tract of cows. And we're not necessarily identifying those microbial players here, but we were really curious about where those microbes might have come from originally. So we took these microbial communities and used DNA sequencing to identify them in those different organs in the cow. But we also took microbial communities that were found um, in that cow's mother. So we took uh, samples from their vagina when they were born. We took samples from the skin or the udder of that cow. And then we also took samples from their milk because there are thriving microbial communities in animal milk as well. And so we compare, compare to the players and those microbial communities from each of these different sources. And if we found one in the stomach that was also found in the milk, then we would color code it that way. And so the different colors on these graphs represent where we think those microbes originated from. So all of the pink and the red and the, the yellows, we think originated from that calf's mother. And then all of the gray portions are ones that we weren't really sure where they came from. And we assume from the environment, but we, we couldn't test everything. So um, those are more of a, a gray box. So yes, I think that is to say the cows are a lot more complicated than they look from the outside, quite amazing. Um, I'm gonna now go on to the next picture because that leads me to say, how much do we know, is it possible to compare the human 
Um, tell me about, sorry, the word microbiome. Maybe you should explain that before we go further. What is a yeah. microbiome? Absolutely. So the, the microbiome is a really complex term and people throw it around because it sounds really cool, but um, well, what it, <laughs> <probably can>. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not always a bad thing, right? What we really mean is when we talk about the microbiome are all of the microbes that are going to be there in that community, but also all of their genomes and what they're capable of doing, because microbes are really, really plastic about what they can do. And it's much easier for them to turn their genes on and off and turn their capacity on or off. So if you give them one thing to eat and then the next day you give them something completely different, their gene expression will change so that they can survive in a way that humans and, and cows simply can't do. And so you kind of need to think about um, all of those players and what they're capable of as a whole um, because knowing which microbe is there might not necessarily give you the answer. So when we talk about a microbiome, um, it's a little bit situational. So the microbiome and all of the microbes that you might find in the mouth are going to be quite different from what you would find um, in the small intestine, just because those are different ecosystems and you might not find all of the same types of microbes different places, especially parasites. Um, you don't necessarily find the same parasites in all locations. So when we think about the, the human microbiome, we also have this idea of biogeography. So in the way that the cow's digestive tract creates this different geography or these different landscapes, we have that same thing to a, um, a little bit lesser extent um, in our own digestive tract, but we are still fairly complicated and we will create these little ecosystems in and around different parts of our body that attract different microbes. And so the microbes that we do attract to our human locations, um, their collective capacity um, can help us in different ways. Um, so for example, whenever we're eating fibrous products, we don't make the enzymes that we need to break that plant fiber down into the smaller sugars that we can actually use. All of our gut microbes or some of our gut microbes are responsible for helping us break down that fiber. And so our gut microbiome often is very fiber, uh, fiber oriented, whereas our skin microbiome has a very different ecosystem and a very different purpose. So at this point, if anybody watching is saying, oh my goodness, there's more to this than we realize, such as me, just to repeat that I've given you some links in the box below to read more of, of, of Dr. Ishak's work and others. Um, we can only literally skate over the surface, but we're heading in the direction of the human body and all the micro uh, activities inside it. It's not a self-contained uh, thing. Is that a fair starting point? Maybe I can move to the next uh, picture to ask you about that, because what I'm trying to understand is, do these, does the human body, is it a self-contained thing relative to the environment that it walks around in, or do they kind of affect each other? Yeah, um, so microbiome scientists are trying to understand this exact context. Um, and so microbes have been part of our body systems for you know eons, much longer than we knew about them. Um, so they've been adding this capacity for, for you know, much of our evolutionary history. And it's only recently that we've had the tools to be able to study them and to know that they're there and what they're doing and to start understanding how they interact with our cells. And so we're, we're reimagining um, sort of humans as animals and where we fit in the ecosystem because we thought of ourselves as very self-contained and that turns out not necessarily to be the case. So um, just, hanging out in an environment, you're interacting with any of the microbes that might be there. So again, if there are microbes on any of those surfaces that you touch, you might be picking things up. If you then, you know, touch some surfaces or touch your phone and then put your hands on your face, you might be transferring those microbes to your mouth or your nose where you can actually inhale them or ingest them. Um, and then anytime we're also interacting with our environment. So every time we scratch our faces, we're releasing our cells and our microbes into that um, into that environment that we're in. So I, I think of it as more of a fuzzy cloud. Um, certainly the uh, human microbiome cloud has been a, a, um, a research project that has been explored and a term that has been created already from my previous researchers 
research colleagues at the University of Oregon. Um, but I, I tend to think of it as uh, maybe not necessarily a hard boundary. So um, our microbes aren't necessarily self-contained and someone else's microbes or the microbes we encounter on a, a regular day might not be um, so self-contained. And so the um, sort of complicated terms that are provided on this slide are to help us sort of give a name to those things. So things like hollow genome or environmental genome, um, these are trying to encapsulate this idea of that uh, our microbes aren't necessarily our own microbes, and we maybe need to think about all of the exposures that we might have in a given day. And really, that's the context that we need to think about as researchers. Um, and there's a word, holobiont. What does that mean? Because I've seen that crop up a lot. What does that word mean? Yeah, that's a, a flashy new term for thinking about an organism within another organism and thinking about them as a unit. So we would be that macro organism, that human body tissue, and you can easily identify our body tissues. We carry a genetic signature that is all our own in all of our tissues, um, but we also carry you know, trillions of microbes. And so if you think of them as a collective cohort and our tissues at the same time, that whole collective would be the holobiont. And you said it's a flashy new term. So this is not something that has been known for decades or thought about for decades. It's a relatively new idea. I think it's a relatively new term for an idea that's been kicking around for a few decades. So back in the 1950s um, and then quite a bit more in the 1970s and since then, we've started to understand that microbes can be more than just disease causing things. Prior to that, we didn't really have a good sense of what they might be doing. Um, and it was really this transformative work involving animals in you know, the last 100 years or so um, that we've started to understand that they might be contributing to breaking down our diet or they might be making um, small chemicals that uh, are beneficial to our body tissues or that can help us fight off other infections. And so we've been um, sort of trying to put a name to that phenomena that we've been studying for quite a bit of time. I mean, so from, from my perspective, it, it's other words to describe the very simple proposition that humans and the, the rest of the world are not separated. And we are now beginning to understand all sorts of different ways in which there is is porosity the right word or not just being connected, but kind of really sort of influencing each other? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great way to think of it. Um, I think of it in terms of, of give and take relationships. So we all have relationships with other humans in our, our daily day, um, and some of those are more involved than others, but we all um, sort of think about them in terms of changing our behavior or what we're going to do with our time or um, the way that we interact with the rest of our society. And so we're trying to sort of envision that, but with microbes kind of laid on top. So yeah, we're, we're reevaluating um, how we think of ourselves as members of a much broader ecosystem and society. Uh, which um, we certainly are. There's a picture here from, I think this is from your talk about the notion that, you know, one thing inside another, um, what um, what how do you think of it as a scientist it's not a kind of literally like a russian doll so the the, the built environment the, the natural environment social circles they all affect each other but in ways we don't totally understand is that one way to for us to think of it yeah absolutely so this was a, a schematic um, that we created as part of a recent publication led by dr jake robinson um, that came out uh, within the last few months. And we were we were trying to do the same thing to visualize this really difficult sort of 3D concept. Um, sometimes I use the analogy of looking at um, like a roadway map and trying to envision um, those roads as connection between different points. So you might have short roads that connect two different buildings and then you've got really long roads that connect two different cities. And so thinking about sort of that immediate uh, physical location being your host and all of the buildings and humans and trees and microbes, right, that might be contained in that small area. Um, but you also have this like large physical distance that connects you to some other person or some other location. And so, yeah, I don't think we've, as a, as a research group, I don't think we've um, found the best way to visualize that. 
but that's well, something with a lot of strings well, will, connected. Yeah, the designers will for sure say, oh, I can think of a different way to tell that story, whether it's a better way for, to be determined, but uh, that's for sure something we can talk about another time. But for, for just to mention that Dr. Jake Robinson's paper is in the text box below, and I believe he's giving a talk in your series, um, Sue, is that correct? So uh, those who want be, to yeah. hear him, yeah, okay. That's all in the box below. Let's um, move on to the next slide, because this is where we start to pose the question about, OK, this is all very fascinating, but what are the kind of social consequences of, yeah, the different relationships we have to microbial communities? And I think this is where you are, from my perspective, doing very groundbreaking work in connecting this scientific understanding with social um, justice and injustice. Is that maybe what we're looking at here? Tell me what uh, this story Thank you, is. yeah. So this is another really commonly used um, cartoon that I really like. So in the panel that's on the left, we see three people trying to reach these apple trees and they're all on um, sort of different levels of surfaces. And so one person, two people can't reach that because they just happen to be a little lower. So this would is supposed to represent equality in which everyone has the same resources that they can access. Um, but we we have to appreciate that our societies are not equally created. Um, a lot of that is entirely unintentional. Occasionally it is intentional, um, but we're not all starting from the same point. And so some of us have additional barriers to accessing those same res uh, resources than other people. And so the panel on the right is looking at that same figure except that the two people that started at a lower ground point now have boxes to stand on so they can get to those apples. And so this sort of represents that sometimes you just need logistical interventions in order to let people get to those resources that can allow them to have a healthy lifestyle and also acquire that um, those healthy microbes or that those beneficial microbes that might impact your health in a positive way. And so where I come in with microbes and social equity is this idea that, because of the way our social systems are set up, because of the way our food systems or our ability to access um, natural environments is very different depending on who you are and where you are, that not all of us have the same ability to access those resources, which can help us interact with microbes in a healthy way. And so as a microbiome researcher that wants to promote health, I can tell you all day about the benefits that you might get from eating fiber, but if you aren't able to access those vegetables um, for whatever reason, it's not going to do you any good. And so the work that we do with microbes and social equity is to try and bring a lot of different people to that conversation so that we've got the microbiome science there, we've got social scientists there, but then also we end up integrating or trying to integrate more designers, practitioners, or the people that are doing this on the ground work that can make those logistical changes to sort of bring um, people and resources and microbes together. So the crucial point here, and for sure, this is where the design, you mentioned the word logistical actions or designing relationships to food when they're missing at the moment. But the, the, start, the most important thing I want to emphasize, which I've learned from this work, is that when somebody talks about an unhealthy lifestyle or somebody making poor personal choices, which you do hear some sort of voices say that about, for example, so-called pre-existing conditions, these are not the action of free will. It's people's living and life conditions make it impossible for them to have access to these beneficial resources is that the point you're that's what the injustice or the inequity is that it's not about people making bad personal choices all the time yeah absolutely i mean we've we've certainly all been there where we decide to eat french fries instead of a salad um and doing that once or twice isn't really what we're talking about here what we're talking about is um these a, a lifetime's collection of choices that you end up having to make. Um, and I think everyone has probably been in a situation where you've made a choice where you know that that choice was constrained. And so maybe it impacted your health, maybe it didn't, but we've sort of all been there where um, we didn't have the free ability to make any choice that we wanted or to make anything happen. Um, and so some of those choices, especially that revolve around um, getting healthcare, having access to safe and affordable housing, 
um, certainly having access to a diet and then also having access to maybe like public transportation or other logistical things that can help reduce stress in mm -hmm. your daily life. All of those things can potentially impact our microbes. And so if we're um, financially constrained and we're not able to pick the best housing for us or any housing for us, that can really impact your life and impact the, the things that you can do. So again, I can tell you all about how great it is to eat fiber, but if you just if there's no fiber um, in your area because you happen to live in a food desert and there aren't good grocery store um, set up or potentially um, you're couch surfing or you're, you're housing insecure and so you can get that fiber but you've got no kitchen or no implements to cook them with or prepare them with, um, you know, that's not going to do you any good. So as microbiome researchers, I, I or a microbiome researcher, I want to know where those sort of... Um, logistical problems end up coming up such that I can start working with people to make better recommendations so that I feel like my science is actually getting put to good use. Which is, I'm sure, something that designers, I mean, I do quite a lot of work on what is called food systems, but it's all about relationships between where people who need food are and where the food is, and there's a lot of problems with those relationships. You've done work on this, and something very interesting I've heard you say is that it's not just about physical access, but it's other forms of access or lack of access, which where the injustice crops up. So this, I think, is from your part of the world in Maine. Is that right? So tell me what I'm yeah. looking at. Yeah. Yeah. So this is um, a close up of New England and specifically Maine. The state is right there in the middle. That red dot is showing where the University of Maine is in Orono. And so Orono is a, um, a town where collectively with Orono and the next town over You've got about 11,000 people and it's about 10 miles from Bangor, which is a much bigger city center, but still only has maybe 35,000 people in it. Um, and so most of Maine as a state is considered to be a rural area, um, all but like two cities down in the bottom are considered rural. And the color coding on this map um, is overlaid with the USDA food map data. Um, this is from 2015. They, they update it every so often, um, but the green color coding is areas where it was considered to be a food desert. So because Maine is a rural area, this would be anywhere where you have to travel more than 10 miles to get to a food source. So grocery store, even a gas station, anything like that. And so you see like most of the state actually isn't highlighted in green um, because it doesn't meet that 10 mile distance. But um, I can tell you from personal experience that uh, just because you're fewer than 10 miles doesn't mean it's completely accessible. So I happen to live um, about halfway between Bangor and Orono. Um, I'm on one sort of major road where there are no uh, shoulders, so I can't really bike to anywhere. I certainly can't do it safely. Um, there are definitely no sidewalks. And anytime it's winter, we often have a lot of ice and snow. And so it makes it really impassable for pedestrians or non-car traffic, right? Um, so for a while, I was, um, I was sharing a car with a partner. Um, we occasionally have trees that come down in storms and will block the road or power lines will go down and block the road. And so like, I'm really, I'm, I'm in a very uh, privileged position or part of my life. Um, you know, I don't have problems with food access if I don't want to, but I'm essentially one mishap away from not being able to access food, even in a place where I am, which is not a food desert. And so we don't really think about all of those other little lifestyle burdens that kind of crop up in a day. So um, if you uh, have childcare or other family care responsibilities, if you're um, sharing transportation or if you have public transportation that's just really slow or maybe uh, doesn't work with your work schedule, you know, if you're um, if you have a mobility or any other physical disability that really um, can impact you. And so um, you start to like stack all of these circumstances where it can make getting food really, um, really onerous to do, even if that food is there and present for you. And again, that doesn't even take into consideration whether you've got places to cook that food, whether you've got the resources to cook that food, right? And so um, so when, I, when we talk about like food inequity and food systems, there's no one solution that's ever going to fit everybody. Even in Maine, you couldn't come up with one solution. It really needs to be community-based and community-driven. 
Um, and so I think designers and, and planners and architects can have a really, really big impact when um, we talk about food systems because it's really a logistics problem. Like we have enough food, it's just not getting to the people that need to get to it. This is so crucially important, but you know, it's a universe of detail here, but we need to just, this is, picture is about the microbiomes that enable people to have healthy or less healthy lives are connected to geography, to place, to logistics. And so you have these multiple different scales. And so a lot of the designers watching this will indeed be trying to understand the best way to intervene in food systems, for example. And I think that figuring out how to kind of balance these different scales of geography and place and body is going to be what we all have to do going forward with in particular, no global solution. It's not a model you can work out in your head and apply all over the world. It's more or less the opposite of that. Yeah. Um, let me move on to um, another related subject, which is uh, the air pollution, because this is another thing which I didn't realize that there were microbiomes in the air, but I learned that from your work. Um, tell me a bit more about the, uh, the inequity in terms of how exposed we are to good and bad air. Yeah, so... Um... I don't personally do that much research with air pollution, but I do incorporate it quite a bit into my teaching. And so this is one of the papers that I talk about quite a bit um, by Tessa et al. in 2019. And so they were looking at um, industrial or commercial sources of air pollution across the uh, continental US and mapping out by where those happen. So for example, where are wildfires likely to impact air pollution? Where are um, uh, agricultural, uh, entities likely to impact air pollution. And then um, overlaid to that, they looked at um, uh, ethnic populations or um, racial populations and where they were most likely to be. And then also thinking about the, um, the consumers of any one of those industries. So obviously there's no consumers to wildfires, but um, you know, food production and roadway production and transport definitely benefits certain peoples in the U.S. versus others based off of just who that consumer is. And so what this map is looking at um, was breaking it down into three very broad racial categories and assessing the amount of pollution that was created on your behalf based off of those things that you're buying versus the amount of air pollution that you're exposed to because of your co-location to some of those sources. And so what this is showing is that um, those populations who are Black or Hispanic in the 48 states um, tend to be exposed to much more air pollution than is created on their behalf, whereas white populations tend to be exposed to less air pollution than is caused on their behalf. Um, and so obviously, if this were equal across the board and we were causing as much pollution as we are being exposed to, then you might say like, okay, well, um, you know, that we should obviously reduce pollution, but we are, um, you know, we're getting what we asked for in a way. But because we have this huge disparity in terms of who's being exposed to versus who's benefiting from any of these things, because again, it's not like we're going to stop producing roads and stop producing agriculture. We need these sources of things. So there's going to be pollution caused, but um, we really need to identify where those, um, those differences are such that we're not, um, predisposing certain peoples to all of the terrible uh, um, the terrible um, outcomes that happen related to air pollution. Well, I just wanted to, to, to understand this picture because you know this is the air we breathe and you, with the previous bit of the conversation was about the food we eat. All of these things are about the relationship between our bodies and our environment. And here you have another example of why we end up being less resilient. Um, if we live, if we're poor or people in, in those areas, then we have more to contend with. And it's not about making bad choices or about having unhealthy lifestyles that we've chosen. And then that's the kind of the moral position. And then the design question is, how do we improve the situation of people living who are at the moment exposed to those um, poor flows of air, I guess. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's another great example of like, there are logistical problems that can be solved to resolve things because it's not like you're going to move an entire city's worth of people. Um, you might not be able to move that entire industry and those pollution sources. Um, and so thinking about ways that we can mitigate risk 
is a really great way to intervene because um, realistically we're not we're not going to solve this with any one intervention. We're going to need a multitude of interventions and ways of thinking about this. But I think what this leads me on to the third part of our the final part of the conversation about um, what actions can we take um, as designers, but also in the, these other disciplines we've talked about. Um, with this knowledge that you're bringing to us about microbial ecosystems. And this, I think, is another picture of Dr. Jake Robinson or one of your colleagues looking at kind of the big picture of, in an urban situation, of something called a microbiome-inspired green infrastructure or MIGI. And this word infrastructure will get a lot of architects and designers interested because that's the yeah, that's what we know about. So how far are we towards being able to understand what a microbially friendly infrastructure would be like? How much, how close are we to that as a design brief? Yeah, so Jake does quite a bit of work in that. Um, and there are quite a few um, landscape architect uh, researchers and microbiome researchers who have been kind of thinking about this for a bit of time because it's a fairly new idea and a new strategy. Um, a lot of the research that's been done has been looking at very basic mechanisms. So if we put a plant in a house, what's happening with those microbes? Is it making an appreciable difference? Does that difference last a long time? What happens when we open windows and we've got outdoor microbes that get indoors? And so we've been um, a scientist trying to answer these very basic questions that uh, may or may not impact um, humans and may or may not impact our ability to have these designs. But I, I think there's also been quite a bit of work from just a design standpoint of, well, we, we like plants, right? Like they do a little bit of work purifying our air. Um, they're great to look at. They certainly help with that biogenic feel. And so even if we don't necessarily know if they're having a, a noticeable impact on indoor microbiomes or our microbiomes, we certainly like plants and we can start making those design decisions based off of other things that we think, but just haven't proven um, uh, in the microbiome world. And so bringing in more green infrastructure is the great example of this where um, we understand the benefits to um, sort of our mental health. We understand the benefits to uh, reducing the temperature in cities just by bringing in more shading and green space. We know that bringing in more plants will help bring in insects and pollinators and birds. And so we can kind of recreate the ecology. And so like collectively, all of those things are, are great for us as humans. If you think about us in terms of that broader ecosystem, even if we have no idea yet what impact, if any, this has on our microbiome. But initial studies involving humans, which are just kind of tricky to do, um, which is why we don't have that many of them yet, show that being around more green space and having more access to natural environments does seem to have a beneficial impact to our microbiome in a variety of ways. And so um, I think we can we can start making these choices knowing that we'll, we'll fill in those uh, questions that we still have with the science over time. Well, I can say things you're probably too polite to say, which is a lot of designers and architects and developers like and know that people like greenery, but that's not the same thing as saying they've studied or have any deep understanding about different sorts of green. They're frankly rather better, some of them, at making buildings covered in plants without having any great insight into whether they're the right plants or whatever. And I see in this image, you have the soil, which I know lots of people are getting very excited about the importance of soil. And that's another one of these vast subjects that you get a bit closer to soil and you think, oh my goodness, it's very complicated. So the notion of thinking about the soil in the city as part of the picture, that's another whole dimension, which I'm fairly sure not so many of the design world have thought about yet. And we need people from your world to tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. There are some um, really fabulous researchers um, at the University of Oregon and other places that are specifically looking at um, soil systems in cities um, in terms of biodiversity and supporting plant life and supporting more microbes, but also thinking about what that's doing to the quality of soil and whether that impacts how easy it is for that soil to drain water or to absorb more water. So we're thinking about wastewater management in these systems. Um, and then there are a number of uh, really brilliant um, landscape ecologists who are thinking about, okay, how do we take an ecosystem that usually is entirely 
uh, biological or entirely natural, and we now bring it into this cityscape where um, it has to kind of graft onto these areas that are not biological at all. So thinking about, you know, how much soil and how much green space do we need and how many species do we need in order to make it self-sustaining. But for example, I didn't know until two weeks ago about the existence of something called the phylosphere, that the surfaces of plants is another whole world of microbes and all sorts of activities. That, uh, so that's an important part of the story, which people like me presumably have a lot of catching up to do. Absolutely. My, uh, plants have their own microbes that they are friends or foes with. And um, the nice thing about any form of biodiversity is that the more you have, the more you have. So the more plants we bring in, the more microbes they're likely to support, the more types of insects they're likely to support. And so you start building on these layers of ecology um, and these layers of biodiversity such that eventually you get to the point where there's enough of them um, that they can support each other and sustain each other like they would out in kind of that natural environment. This is very good for my the last picture and then we'll, we'll wrap it up because I wanted to ask you, you know, what do microbes like? Well, good microbes, what do they like? What, what makes them thrive? Is it Do we know uh, diversity and complexity seems to be uh, one of the basic things that that is it a positive? Is that right? Yeah. So healthy microbiome is is really difficult to describe and tends to be very situationally specific. So we could probably guess what a healthy microbiome in the gut would look like for most people. It's not going to be the same for every person. But thinking about what a healthy microbiome is out in the environment is a little bit more um, tricky to do. And the research is just a little bit more logistically tricky. So it, it takes a little bit longer for us to get there, but we're getting there. Um, and so when we think about what a healthy microbiome might be in a urban a landscape might be, um, we're trying to think about things that um, certainly don't cause us harm and things that you would probably find in a similar ecosystem out in the wild. So the, the diversity that you find in terms of microbes in the soil is just overwhelming. There's so much diversity that's out there in the soil and that's partially because there are a ton of different plants and animals and insects and other things that are, are sort of feeding that. And so um, it seems like having more complicated biodiversity and having more complicated microbial communities seems to not only help sustain more biodiversity but seems to be beneficial to us in that if those microbes come from really complicated communities, um, it kind of keeps them all in check and prevents any one of them from getting um, sort of uh, too high up in that food chain, which is usually what happens when you um, get soil pathogens that, uh, that can cause some difficulties in humans. Um, so yeah, it, it seems like having just more diversity um, and more interactions helps keep any one of those single interactions in check. So by the sound of things, it's, we're not gonna arrive at some point when there's a very simple recipe. If you have 10 of these plants and five of these microbes and everything will be fine. It's gonna be um, iterative, evolutionarily, constantly changing. And maybe that, I'm gonna just stop sharing if that's okay. Uh... Yeah, so I, I think we've been, um sort of thinking about this as an end point rather than a life strategy. And I think we need to think about microbiomes as a life strategy. So there's no one solution. There's no um, perfect design. There's no perfect diet. There's no one probiotic that you can take that's going to resolve issues forever. Um, if you, um, you need to think about these, these microbes that you think about yourself, right? Like you have a daily care routine, you need to eat every day, you need to drink water every day, um, and you need constant care to keep yourself in good working order. And microbiomes are sort of the same thing, where if we want to have good lifestyles and, and make those healthy choices, we need to be able to do this on a regular basis. If we want to construct more eco-friendly cities and we want more microbiome-friendly cities, it's something that's going to take a little bit more um, more daily care from us as, as humans. So we need to start thinking about it as more of an active process um, that we integrate into our lives. Which will be not such a small challenge for people like a park manager or the mayor of a medium-sized city who's got uh, yeah budget constraints and all sorts of multiple demands on their time. Um, and now we come along and say, by the way, we need a kind of team of 
different disciplines to be looking after the microbiomes of your city, uh, please add that to your to-do list. But that's sort of where we're headed. Um, is that a way to describe it? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Um, I think the, the nice thing is that because there are so many different ways that you can approach this, it means that there are so many different possible solutions and that any little effort in the right direction is, is a helpful amount of effort. So sometimes these things can seem really insurmountable and that there's no way that um, you could break into this. But again, even thinking about small changes, like how are your building occupants going to use windows? How do they get in and around spaces? Um, how accessible are those spaces? How much connection do they have to the natural world? These are all really small things that you can make a difference in in your particular design. And over a lifetime, that equates to quite a bit of difference in that person's life and that person's interactions with microbes. And so um, I feel like having this idea of trying to make people's lives a little bit better, trying to get them those healthy resources, um, anything where you can do that falls under that umbrella will probably also help them recruit healthy microbes or interact with uh, microbiomes. Yeah, I mean, I've learned that from your colleagues is that things like food forests or you know communal fermentation activities, uh, anything to do with growing things or making food or fermentation, those activities, they're biologically intense and complex, and they're good things to have going on. And we don't have to, we don't all have to become scientists or experts in but by microbiomes in order to be part of these living processes. That's the, so designers watching this, it's, you don't have to become, so you have to know the scientists who can help us make the right choices, but it's actually different disciplines enabling all the citizens to be part of it. Yeah, I would say that most scientists tend to be um, a little bit more cautious about making recommendations. So mm. we're very, yeah, we're in this world of like always second guessing ourselves and always trying to think about where we might be wrong or where we might be making assumptions. But we all are very familiar with where the science is. We're all very familiar with um, possible solutions. We're just really shy about making recommendations. And so I think having science and um, uh, professional or outside of science partnerships can be really, really, really beneficial in this way. So I don't have the time to become a designer myself. Um, and I'm sure you all don't have the time to become microbiome scientists, but we don't have to. We just have to be having these conversations where we can share information um, and I can give my science to people who might actually make an impact um, and people who are out there in the daily lives, thinking about buildings, thinking about food systems um, and having that kind of eye on how it works in the real world can really impact my research and how I think about my experimental design such that it creates this nice little feedback loop. It's so inspiring uh, talking to you. The micro, um, uh, Microbes and Social Equity Group it's in the box below is the community that some of our community could maybe visit and find out more about. But Dr. Sue Ashak, thank you so much for your time and for doing great work and such, being such a great communicator for people like myself to learn more. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much again for, for having me and um, for stimulating this conversation. This was great. Great. Thank you so much.